find the tribe, find the people that you want that align with your values. Try to find the people that are aligned with your goals and try to get aligned with them or try to make friends with them, be next to them, because they'll only make you better. And it's like my fitness goal and my fitness aspirations. God made you in, in the image of himself. Then that is your his body. That's your him. You want to take care of that body. You don't want to abuse it or whatnot, because that in, in essence is going against him or just abusing him. And we only have this body for one time in our lives. So we've got to take care of it. <clears throat> nurture it and try to be a better version of myself. This is the Fit Investor Podcast, where we talk about how to live a more holistic life of being fit, not only financially, but physically and faithfully. We'll be joined by experts in all these areas to share their experiences and actionable and practical tips so that you can be a fit investor too. So now let's join our hosts, Kale Delaney and Brenna Carls. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of The Fit Investor. I'm your host, Kale Delaney, here with Brenna, the bodybuilder, Carls. Hey, look at those guns. And today, our special guest is Ramel Javier. And Ramel is, he's a Christian, father of two, married to an amazing woman for 11 years, lives in beautiful Southern California, and he's just trying to be the best husband and father he can be. But while doing that, he's a real estate investor and a nurse anesthetist by trade. And he's passionate about being a better version of himself than he was yesterday. So with that, Mr. Ramel, thank you for joining us on The Fit Investor. Yes. Thanks, Kale. I, I really appreciate that introduction. I wrote it down, but I'm like, I can't say it. When I talk about it and I say it, and I'm like, that doesn't sound right. But you made it super awesome. <laughs> it used to be a hard man. That's my job. <laughs> yeah, he does those really well. I'm glad he's the one that does those because I would not. I would probably butcher them. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure you do a great job, but thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. I stumbled on your guys' book page and I thought you guys have a great sort of like a form of like faith, fitness and finance. And I really love those three, but anyway, yeah, as far as a little story about myself, I've grown and born and raised in Southern California all my life. Um, now by trade, I'm like, I'm a nurse. So I've, I've been a nurse for the, I saw my. I had licensed uh, 21 years and, um, I've been doing nurse anesthesia for the last 12. I love it. I love the, the aspect of nursing and nurse anesthesia. I love just helping people. The best part of anesthesia is that everybody is always wanting our, our help. They're always happy to see me. And, uh, when they wake up, they're always smiling and happy for the most part. Yeah. You hope. And, and that's the goal. At least I have a goal and I can like most of the time hit that goal. With a lot of pharmaceutical men, <laughs> I could definitely hit that goal. One of the best parts of my job is going into the labor and delivery. And once I see laboring a uh, patient, she's just in excruciating pain. And I love putting epidurals in it. Once I put the epidural in and the, the pain uh, goes from a hundred to down to a two or a three, they're smiling. There's everybody's good. Even the husband's thanking me. So. I love that part of my job. How many times for that? How many times do the people, the women go in there like, I'm having a natural birth and then it's, it's, it hits a certain point there. they're like, give me the drugs. Oh uh, yeah. I would say nine out of eight out of 10 times. Really? Oh, okay. There's like, anomaly of two out of the 10 that are like, you know, I know my limits and when I can have it, I can, I'll have it. But most of the time, eight out of, like 80% of the time, there's like the way there's a lot of, most of the, they want like a natural birth. They don't want anything. The one thing that I've got to do to make them feel better, because obviously it's not part of their birth plan. I just tell them like, you got to this point. There is no, we're here to follow your birth plan. And sometimes we, we have to a little tweak it or alter it, but you, we always give them praise for how far along they've gotten into this, to this. So you're saying 80% so, uh, come in and you say 80% is like, oh, I'm going to do this natural, but 80% then are like, I need that thorough. No, 80% uh, just want a natural birth. They do not want an epidural. Right. But do they get it though? Do they like, oh, they get it? Yeah. They, oh, after the 80%, probably about, I want to say 90% of them do so out of the eight, probably all seven of them will get the epidural. One of them will power through. Check it out. And a lot of them, a lot of times I tell them the ones that they, a lot of them, they feel defeated because they right. are either, they get the, the epidural. A lot of the times it's not by through their, their thoughts, it's more or less like their, fa their family members, the old grandma or aunt saying that I never had an epidural and I had nine kids. Why do you need one? 
grandma's house. Yeah, oh, exactly, grandma. <laughs> well, exactly. So, uh, so I have to tell them, you're not getting any brownie points if I getting up a girl, <laughs> but you did go up to this point, get up to this point, and a lot of people don't. Yeah, mm-hmm. and lately, like the last two years, obviously we had COVID happen mm-hmm. and it changed all of our lives. And that was a more, that was like a real eye opener for me. I was at that point, I wasn't seeing people needing anesthesia to get better. They called in our services just for more or less for end of life. And so there were times where I would get called in and I was the last face that most, if not all of these people saw. Mm -hmm. And that was, it was, it it definitely was like an eye opening and a spiritual moment for me because a lot of the times you can see during my nursing career, I'd see an end of life situation here and there. I worked in the ICU, but more or less during COVID, I saw more in those like year and a half than I had in the last, in the previous 18 years. Mm-hmm. And that kind of really did just jump started my, like sort of mindset of what is, there's gotta be more than just working. I love working. I love doing the job, but it's literally a job. And that's when I started going down the rabbit hole all of what can I leave? What about my children? What about the legacy that I can leave? And, and so that's when I started reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the purple Bible that other people talk about. And that really opened my eyes to, okay, there's gotta be a purpose for why I'm working and, and they're paying me and I gotta do something for my kids and leave some for my kids. So that's when I started investing in real estate. And so a couple of years ago, um, a friend of mine just called me. I didn't know where I was going to do, what I was going to do, what I was going to, where I was going to invest in. I was, I'm in Southern California. Prices are super sky high, not a really landlord friendly state. So I didn't really want to invest here, but I don't, I think to, literally it was like a divine intervention. I was reading that book and literally praying that I would come back to work, come back from work safely. Just asking, asking the Lord what I wanted, what did he like there's got to be more. I, I don't know if this is, if this is my calling and, and this is it, then that's fine. But I got a call from a friend of mine out of the blue and he asked me, Hey, do you want a job here in North Carolina? And it was a classmate of mine. And I said, no, I don't really want, I'm here in Southern California. I asked him why. And he said, a friend of mine, he quit or he went part-time because he's doing really good in real estate. And I said, really? And, um, I said, no, I don't thank you for the offer, but I really want to get his number, his phone number and talk to him. And that was at that moment, I called his name was Wesley Jackson and he introduced me. He said, Hey, we're, this is what we're doing. We have a brokerage company, we have a mortgage company. We'd like to, I uh, would do Airbnbs. It's all in Pinehurst. I have no idea what Pinehurst is, where it is, what it is, what it's all about. But I said, okay, hey, well, then. Talk to me about it. And that's then about a few months later after that, it was like 2021 in September, we closed on a little home in, in Pinehurst and it's an Airbnb and it was a golf community. It's a golf community. It's been doing really well. He manages it. So I have something where I know people were saying that you can self-manage and make more money, but I didn't feel like me personally, I thought that it was a favor, not a favor, but it was like just a sign from God to saying he, this guy blessed you with the opportunity and I'm blessing his like staff with the opportunity to like have a job so they can manage it or whatnot. So we did that. And then, and then a year later we got another property, but not through Wesley, but I got one in Maggie Valley, a cabin in Maggie Valley and after, um, and so we've had that for since December. And so that was my learning, learning curve to self-managing and whatnot. And that's where we're How's at today. How's the cabin in Maggie Valley doing? So far, surprisingly well, because sure. when I actually started right after we got the Pinehurst property, I told Wesley, I'm like a couple months later, I'm like, man, I got to get another one. And he was like, pump the brakes. Let's see how this works. It was a true testament of, hey, just be patient. Cause I was like, I'd see, I have a lot of imposter syndrome. I was, I was, I have, I, I'm a guilty of that. And so I'd see all these people scaling from one to nine in two weeks yeah. and yeah, so it's, it, I mean, that's what it seemed like. And so a few months after that, I said, okay, let me start the journey. Let me see if I can get a cabin because, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I went down the rabbit hole of investing short-term rentals, then doing the short-term rental, like tax hack of cost aggregation. So it's like I wanted to get a cabin because the land to value is, or the property value versus the land is a lot more. So I went and I checked out LJ Blue Ridge. I had a realtor up there. I tried making offers and everybody was just 
paying or offering over asking. And I was sticking to my guns as far as I, I don't think I could do that. The numbers just, it's, it'll just tap us out. And, and then I, I, I stumbled on like another podcast with a realtor, Tyler Kuhn, and he is out in Western North Carolina and I love North Carolina. I think it's a great state. And so we talked about it, but he sent me the emails and just this one cabin like popped up on his email. And at that point, the rates were going up and I'm like, I, I don't know about this, but every time I fell asleep, I, I thought about the cabin. I thought the email came up. I talked to my friend that called me from North Carolina. He got, he told me that his friends would, they love Maggie Valley. People would retire there. I had no idea about Maggie Valley. I saw the logistics of Maggie Valley. So it's close to Asheville. So I figured, well, that's not that bad. People can fly in and Asheville's a nice little hit place. I decided to put an offer in and uh, we got it. And it's doing surprisingly well be, for what I thought, just because with the recession happening and uh, I knew that there was going to be a downturn in occupancy and it's not the Smoky Mountains of Gatlinburg were killed at. So it's not, it's 12 million people go to that side, from that side. But for the most part, I've been, the occupancy probably been like 60%, 60 to 65%. And I don't, I need to put, in more like marketing and more, I don't put as much work in as I, I should. I do the, do the, I do have a nice tech stack or whatnot, but this is like last month, like in July, I believe we had 90% occupancy. So it was, it was really nice, but it's been like our September, so I like 50% and I've got like a few bookings here and there in October, November, usually they're like last minute, like right. maybe five days out bookings with Maggie Valley. Do you mind sharing? Cause I'm not too familiar with Maggie Valley. I just hear about it every now and then, but do you mind sharing the little bit of the details, like the size, the price and what your estimated revenue is on it? Yes. Maggie Valley is about 30 to 45 minutes the, uh, west of Asheville. It's really, it's real nice and majestic. It's, it's got like this nice little downtown area. It, like Waynesville is like another kind of a small, uh, like a bigger downtown area or city right there. And. So if you go north of Waynesville, tucked in the mountains off of Soco Road. And so the size of the cabin is a four, it's this has three bedroom, but there's a basement where there's a bedroom and a bathroom mm -hmm. and there it's three bedroom, three, so it's three bedroom with a basement and three bath on each level. And it's, it's up on like sheep back mountains. So like getting there, it, it's a, I don't know, I wouldn't say a challenge, but it's, it's like a gravelly road and it's, it's got a lot of, a lot of switchbacks. It was, it, it's perched up. It's got a nice view. So I really like it. The price that we purchased it at was 485 and we used the second home loan, the 10% down. And then we, as far as the projected revenue at the beginning of the year, that was where me, my green, me and being green with this whole industry or whatnot was like really showed. So at the beginning of the year when I bought it, I was projecting close to maybe 80. Seventy to eighty thousand dollars gross, but now I'm projected. So far, we've got we've hit like forty k gross revenue, and that's literally. I think I started probably coming full swing in the middle of February. Okay. Um, we had a couple bookings from the old from uh, the previous owner that I had to honor, and that was in December, um, a couple weeks in December. But um, I. Closed it out for January to get, to redesign it, put some new uh, furniture, touch it up a little bit. And then mid-February from some, from mid-February from now, we've hit 40,000 in gross revenue. I'm going to say conservatively, maybe like 55 to 60,000 this year, by the end of this year, mm -hmm. that's hopefully what we're going to, we're going to hit. And that's literally me just, I'm like learning on the job. So I work full time plus here down as a nurse anesthetist. So. Any open time I've gotten, I can, I'm like learning like the tech stacks or trying to learn how to price, I guess, price strategies and, uh, marketing. I just started my, the, the Instagram page and, and just going on the four Facebook forums and really pushing it slowly, but surely trying to do that. And so hopefully we can gain momentum and next year it'll be a little better. Yeah. I'm going to say the next yeah. conference I speak at, I'm going to say that I grew my portfolio in not for not with nine properties in two weeks and see who's paying attention or who's actually like paying attention <laughs> instead of like you seeing those nods like actually I think you're going to actually get more revenue you haven't done the fall season yet right with Maggie Valley no no 
Right. I think he might get a little more revenue. I think he might see like 60000 seems pretty good. I would say maybe a little more than that because it's the, the fall foliage is so beautiful around here. And uh, Maggie Valley is a really pretty area. The cool thing about that area, I think, is, and hopefully not everybody will start going and buying there and prices won't skyrocket, but that area, that side of the, the Smoky Mountain. So when you get to the North Carolina side, here in, the, in Tennessee, you can't, it's like pretty strict when you go on the trails. You can't bring your dogs or anything like that. But on the North Carolina side, you can bring your dogs. And so it's very dog friendly. It's more laid back. And you've got the Asheville lob. And so I Maybe. think that area is going to be the next bigger area to increase in appreciation because of those types of outdoor adventurous people that do have in our generation. A lot of people, instead of having like kids right now, they're having more dogs and treat right. them as their children. So I think I really like that area. Yeah. And let me ask you, Ramel, so with the job being a nurse anesthetist, is that, do you have a lot of flexibility in that job where you can check your phone and answer messages or are you tied up in blocks where you might not be able to answer messages for a while? Depending on the assignment of the day, it's not like, it's so it's not, I can be an OB one day and I have a lot of time in between. So I can they can call me for an epidural and obviously pre-epidural and probably take less than 10 minutes. And then after that, it's okay, then I have downtime. I'm waiting for the next one. It's not like a, a line of laboring patients wait for the epidural and just go next, 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 next. <laughs> so that, if I have an assignment like that, then sure, I have a lot of blocks of time. But if it's like, if I'm in the operating room and, I'm, and I've got like a bunch of, I, yesterday I was with neurology and we're doing a lot of like kidney stones and bladder tumors. And so those are like fast, but, and so those are a lot of cases fast. And so that point I've got to, it takes my whole chunk of time take is getting him to sleep, give him the med, waking up, then the next, mm -hmm. next one comes in or whatnot. So it just depends on the day. Let me ask you this. Why do you, why do people tell us when we wake up? It makes me mad because I'm very headstrong. If somebody tells me not to do something, I'm like, don't tell me what to do. But they tell me, don't rub your eyes because as soon as I wake up, I'm like, I'm weird. And I'm tr I try to like open my eyes and I try to see, and then I can't see that well. And so I start rubbing my eyes. And then my husband told me one time, they're like, don't rub your eyes. And I just looked at him angrily. And then when they turned around, I was <laughs> Yeah. Because <laughs> usually we're worried about corneal abrasion. That's why. Because you're like you, scratching you're, your you're, eye. Scratching your eyes. Yeah. Um, so you're asleep for X amount of time. We tape your eyes closed, shut, but you don't have the natural like lubricant. You're not blinking. So after a while, your eyes get super dry. And then usually the tendency is let's scratch your eyes and usually you scratch really hard. And then a lot of the times that was like one of the major um, complaints <clears throat> is corneal abrasion. A lot of them is nausea and a lot of guys that are muscular, they have, they come out with myalgia. Some of the medications that we use causes them to stiffen up so they can oh. relax. And so they have body wide body aches. So if you're oh. very, really muscular, a lot of the times, yeah, one medication that we give, it acts as a paralytic instead of relaxing your muscle, it, it, it like tenses you up and then it relaxes you, but it's, so you'll wake up flexed. Time. You'll like wake up and initially while we, it's <laughs> just initially when we, it's just initially when we intubate you and then we relax and, yeah. and that's just the mechanism of, of how it works. So next time Gil goes under, yeah. he's going to, as soon as he wakes up, he's going to tell his like, uh, okay. Nerves to take a selfie on. Just, just in case, just in case you know that Paul. Yeah, it's there are times where there's the confessions have happened as they go under, which kind of is, is weird. You confessions? It's where is it? Hey, yeah, it's really weird. So. It's like when when they're going under, when they're coming out. When they're going under. When they're is going it because under, they, they feel like to, they, they may die in their sleep and they're confessing stuff, or is it because they're loopy and they don't know what they're talking? They're loopy. Okay. They're loopy. It's not a confession of I murdered somebody. Something. It's, it's, oh, you're real. Oh my gosh, you're real good looking or whatever. I go. Oh, that's the same. <laughs> like, that's conflict breaks. That's the joke. Okay. <laughs> it's flattering, <laughs> but you can't even see me. So I don't know. I, exactly. Yeah. I look like it's a beer goggles on. Exactly. <laughs> not looking good right now, guy. Okay. That's right. So. Other fun confessions. I know I'll get back. I, I told, I said I wouldn't ask stupid questions this time, but other, <laughs> other confessions, like you look really good or whatever. I remember <laughs> when I got my wisdom teeth done, I woke up. I don't know what I was thinking. I remember talking to the guy that was helping the 
oral surgeon. And he was like, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm just getting through school. And I don't know. The last thing I remember is when I was, they were walking me to my car, I patted him on his hand and I was like, you're going to be okay. You're going to do just fine. Like, mm-hmm. You try. Re- it. So what kind of stuff do you hear? Oh, I think the, well, one of the worst one was like, we were, the guy came in, knew the doctor was saying like, Hey, I, they're talking to, they're talking shop, talking about the family. And as he was trying to, and he was going under, he goes, I'm getting a divorce from my wife. And I go, what is going on? And he was like, and my, the doctor was like, excuse me? Yeah. And he just falls. Oh no, no. So I go, what was that about? Oh, and I'm sorry. I don't know. I told my, I told the, the, the doctor, I was like, I don't know what you want to do with that information, but that was huge. So you don't think they'll remember that when they wake up? No, they don't. At that point where but you don't I, remember? I don't, I really, I don't know. I, I really don't. Once they, when they say something like that, I don't remind them. <laughs> I don't remind them at the end. You I would, as soon as he woke, woke, woke up, <laughs> I'd be like, so how's your family doing? <laughs> the, oh, yeah, that part, I'm like, no thanks. Yeah, I don't. There's some, some, uh, there are younger folks that are like, I take, I have ADD and all that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to beat anesthesia. You're not going to put me down. Okay. We're going to, we always win and we always do win. <laughs> I'm so. like that. I, I don't say you're not going to take, put me down, but they're like, we're going to just give you this stuff that makes you whatever it is, relax. And you probably won't remember. And I'm like, I'll remember. I don't remember. I don't, yeah. rem- I don't remember. You don't remember. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it just reminds me and I'll, I'll we'll, we'll transition off of the anesthesia here reminds me of the Seinfeld episode where Jerry goes into to the dentist and then he wakes up and his, his shirt's untucked and he goes and he's all paranoid about oh, my, my shirt was tucked in I swear what happened they're like okay I do want to point out do you say is it Ramel Ramel mm-hmm. yeah if y'all aren't watching, I like your shirt. It says God first. So just one, we can do oh, the thanks, glance with, since that's the most important. But I do really like that shirt. So yeah, did, let me know. Uh, send me a link or something wherever you got it. For sure. Yeah, let's, let, might as well go into that, uh, that arena because I wanted to ask is similar or along the medicine lines, but are you able to uh, integrate your faith into your medical practice at all? Yeah, absolutely. There are times where I used to work at like a Loma Linda. I rotated there and that's Seventh day Adventist like hospital. And they, a lot of the time they would pray before some surgery. A lot of the patients would ask for it. Now I work at Kaiser <clears throat> over here. And, and so there are times where there are a lot of uh, patients that are very anxious. Mm-hmm. They would ask, or if they were just anxious, I would get cues here and there of whether or not it was okay to just ask. Hey, mm-hmm. can I pray for you? Or would you like to pray? You know what I mean? And, and so there, and I've met a lot of doctors and their colleagues as well, nurses that are real strong in their faith. And prior to COVID, I wasn't like, I'd go to church and I was, I wouldn't say I was as strong as I am now, as far as, and really seeking that mm-hmm. and recently seeking relationship that strengthened that relationship with the Lord. Um, and I really do now, especially after COVID. But now I think it's really shown, it seems like that one, I think that old adage where the cream rises to the top, it's like things kind of show after COVID what, like who, like the real, like people that are strong in their faith and who I really am more attracted, I gravitate toward. And absolutely, there's a whiteboard in our anesthesia department and a friend of mine, Lindsay, and she's, she'd be great. She's also a CRNA and, um, she, she would put like scripture up on the board that would pick us up, especially during dark times. Mm-hmm. And there are times, especially during COVID where, you know, I knew that these were the last, I literally didn't know, but it's a high likelihood that I'd be the last person that they would talk to or see. Right. And I'd pray right before I. I, I want to know about I, that because that's intriguing. So are you saying because they, w- their body needed to heal, so you would think y'all would put them under to get that to try to happen or what do you mean by that they what happens was in, with during covid what in the beginning stages of the covid when people had covid they isolate them they keep them in a room put them on like fluid they didn't know what the therapy was and obviously they started their breathing started would be labored and it's they're just sitting there they're not moving nothing's moving 
fluids would accumulate in their lungs. And at the end of the day, they would be like, this patient is on high flow, high concentration oxygen, and saturation is going down. And they were like, we're going to have to intubate them. And once you're intubated, you're literally breathing through like a boba straw. I don't know right. if you have boba over there, but it's like literally a straw. It's a straw that once you put them under, you put them in the tube. If you're awake, it, like it's the horrible, most horrible feeling because you're trying to catch a breath, but you're doing it through the diameter of a, literally less than a dime. And so we'd have to put them under, we'd have to put them under like anesthesia, like a recognition of anesthesia, like an ICU. And for the most part, most of those people that were there, we, it, you know, it's not like you were moving anything. You, they weren't like moving the fluids or whatnot. And we were trying to, at the time COVID hit, we were just shooting like a, a BB gun in the ocean as far as like therapy is concerned. And for the most part, small chance of, of the small population survived that. But for the most part, they did it. And we did see that. And so for the most part, I was, I think it was like, it's in December. I remember December 10th or 9th or 10th, two years ago is when it was like the most calls I've had. Like before noon, I was with a partner of mine and we would talk, we got called five times to do that, to get them. Like they called us, these guys are gasping for air. I prayed for them. I put the tube in, I'd say, you're going to be all right. And so that was that moment where I was like, this is. It, it just, the anxiety like, shot up, like, what's going on here? And I feel blessed that I got out of it two years later. I don't know why or how I deserve to, to be blessed to, to survive it, but I, oh, so you excited. actually went through it. I, I, no, I was in the, the right. yeah, I was in the, COVID you were in there. People had, they were, I was in there with COVID, they had COVID. <laughs> These are people yeah. that had COVID. They had COVID. You said blown. December. Are you talking about December before it actually, like everybody knew about it? Oh, no, this is December when it was full swing. Okay. 2020, 2021, I believe. I got 20, it. Okay. Yeah, 2020, I believe. 2020, 2021. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned that your faith now is stronger than, than perhaps a couple of years ago. So what was it? Was it these experiences with your work through COVID that, that started bolstering uh, your faith and getting you to seek it out more? Or was there something that was a, a turning point that, that really got you turned on again? Yeah, it was, I've always been, I was raised Catholic. A couple of episodes ago, you were interviewing some lady and she was talking about her, she was raised Catholic or whatnot. And I was raised in the Catholic religion and my parents are like priesters. That's what my wife says. They're, they go to mass on Christmas and Easter. Right. <laughs> That's what they call it, priesters. Yeah. <laughs> and every, and like once a month. And when I, it, it, and I went to a private high school, a Catholic high school, they made high school. And that's what kind of was like, I was curious, I was curious and I went to church every Sunday. I went to mass almost every Sunday. And my parents sometimes were like, oh, I'm tired. And my mom was a nurse. She worked, she worked night shifts. She would go, I did go to church, but I didn't have the right tribe around me. So it was right. just basically, it was just myself. And it really strengthened when I met my wife and she went to a non-denominational Christian church here in Fontana. And that's when I started to go. And that's when everything opened up where I'm like, okay, the worship was good. It's like a mini concert every Sunday. I said, <laughs> bonus. It starts your week, it would be right. And Pastor Dan, he would talk to us and the way he would integrate scripture and in daily life, it was like, I can, it's the aha moment. And so I'd go every Sunday, we'd go every Sunday and that would, that would be great. But what really was the turning point was like, like the birth of my son was one, it was 2018 where but he was born and I was like, wow, I, I, I was blessed. I know a lot of people that are, you know, struggling, trying to get, you know, trying to get pregnant. And we, we had uh, Jordan and he, he was our black and we, we didn't have a problem and he's, he's perfect. And that, at that point I was like, how can, how am I blessed to have that, to be blessed mm -hmm. with that, such a beautiful human being, other people's aren't, other people aren't. And that's when I started kind of, kind of diving in and then COVID hit. And that's when it really like ramped up because through my faith, that's where I was like, a lot of people were in fear. And unfortunately my parents and fear, they feared dying, they feared grabbing, cashing in, fearing the worst that would happen. And for myself, I felt like if it was my time and it was God's plan, I was confident that everything would be okay. No matter what it was, no matter if it was going to go, if I was going to see tomorrow, if I wasn't, I was going to be taken care of. And at that point I was, that's when I started seeing other people through their faith. They got stronger, they got, they were happier. And that's when I gravitated toward that tribe, started reading self-help books, self-improvement books. And a lot of the time 
a lot of the sort of common theme of a lot of these like real estate investors or even like Napoleon Hill being real rich, it's through faith. Mm-hmm. There, a lot of the, the basis is faith. Brandon Turner, he talks about starting his real estate investment journey through his church. And, and those type of individuals is what I thought. And you guys, the real estate the community, they're all about helping people. Austin, you had Austin a few episodes ago. He's a pastor. Just the uplifting guy. It's, these are the people that I really want to gravitate toward. And Ryan Pineda, all these guys. So that's what kind of strengthened me. And when I see these people making, uh, and they make me feel good, I felt that's where I'm thinking, what are they doing that, that I can do to make, my, make others feel feel good as well. And so that's when I started really going deep in my faith. And I'm by no means as accomplished or I'm well-versed as Wesley or, or Austin or whatnot, but I try. And I, I, this shirt that I, that you see me wearing is from my first like men's group that I, uh, like a year and a half ago, a friend of mine, Jeff, when I told him that, Hey, I was struggling with the COVID and it's really, really hit myself, my like mental health hard, like where I'm like, man, I don't know. It's, I really, I'm afraid that I don't want to see my kids or whatever, or I might get sick. And he said, why don't you come to this men's group? I have this group. And it was like, because they never knew that he was, that I could be invited to a men's group one and two, I didn't know he was a man of faith. And when I did go for our first meeting, he gave me this shirt. He said, thank you for coming brother. This is what I want to give you. And we were, and that's basically that kind of got, was another sign where I've said, I've got to, this is where I belong. And that was that. Nice. I do want to stop you right there when you said I'm not as good as whoever accomplished. The thing is you are because you're doing it. So the biggest step is taking that leap of faith per se, whether it's your leap of faith in Christianity or your leap of faith in, hey, this guy reached out to me. He's doing real estate investing and I want to work into it. And I think the biggest accomplishment you can do is looking into something while also having your faith in God and being like, Lord, lead me to the correct path if this is the right path or, or what have you. And the thing is, he's going to put stumbling blocks in your way if it's not the right path. And so for you to have a full-time job, to do something very complicated that I'm very intrigued in and doing the investment journey, now you have two properties or you can tell people you have nine properties in QA, whatever you want to say, but you're doing it. Like you're, you're there. So I know the imposter syndrome, I have that too a lot of times, but you're just as successful as the other person, but you're the best version of yourself and you're continuing to, to do better in your father. And I never like to hear people say not because you are like, you're doing everything that you need to be doing to live the life that you want to live. And that that's God has given you. I'll well, I appreciate that. My high horse say. We're going to, we're going to have to change your nickname now to Brenna pep talk, Carl's. That was good. <laughs> yeah. That's like about, I think she had the other day was the other, one of the episodes she was like, Swimming with sharks or something like that, or snorkeling with sharks. <laughs> no, so that's a, that's like, the thing. Going on here? Said, Taylor, you got to stop doing that. Cause I did. <laughs> hey, I do want to mention. I went to our beach house last week with my husband for just trying to get away for a week, and and we went. I don't know if it was like just bad juju. I don't know what it was. So we met this guy. He's actually from Dandridge, Tennessee, up the road. So that was cool that he moved there, and he's like this fishing guy and. Took a shark fishing, so it was like on the beach. Didn't catch squat. Okay. Nothing. The shark and then, recognition precedes you. The sharks. And then they were cool. like, "We hate this. We really want to show you a good time for yeah. free." They came back the next day and did it all for six hours, six to eight hours. You don't hear people doing that. Let me tell you, I caught a shark. This, 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 your stories are a lot more exciting than these anesthesia stories. This isn't like, exciting. Okay, look at this. Oh my God. This is not <laughs> exciting. This shark was this big. Poor little hey, right, hey. right now. It's probably the size of my forearm, which is very hey, short. The shark of the shark. Oh, I have a picture hey. of it. I have a picture Where's of it, that? and I can say that I have wrestled the shark, and that's all I'm going to say. Oh, you yeah. can imagine how big it was. But you wrestled um, the baby shark. Yeah, so. Cue the music. Baby the baby shark, the baby shark wrestler. <laughs> it was like the little teethies were so cute. But anywho. Yeah, that's the only experience I have with, with sharks, really, to actually catch one and bring it in. But yeah, it was uh, fun. I don't know how we uh, got on, but yeah. Yeah, okay. Hey, guys, it's Brennan Carl, CEO and co-founder of The Mortgage Shop. 
When I'm not spending my time searching for the best pizza in town, working out because of pizza, or fighting sharks as Kale likes to say, I spend my time educating clients on the best investment products that will help them build generational wealth and making sure their loan process is as smooth as warm butter on a piece of toast. Call us today to get started with your investment journey at 800-816-7982 or talk more about pizza. Talk to you soon. Back to faith. <laughs> so one of the uh, one of the other things I wanted to pick your brain on is, is because I know as you're active in our Facebook group, which I appreciate. Sure. Uh, <laughs> but I know a lot of things that, that you post are focusing on <clears throat> your family and mm -hmm. trying to be a better husband and father. And so I want to just ask you about that and, and mm -hmm. explore that. What, how, how does your faith play into that? And what do you do perhaps to try to become a better husband and father? Yeah, we, me and my wife, we always try to implement where we actually, we do implement prayer and a lot of things we do with, especially with our kids. We pray at the dinner table, we pray for our breakfast. I pray nightly with my kids. I always tell my son, can I pray for you? And I'm always praying that he would always be a better, a better man than I ever will be. And he already is. I do that. Me and my wife, we pray, we pray uh, together most nights. And we, a lot of the time we, um, I, in the morning, I, I usually wait, I most of the time wake up far earlier than everybody else. And what I do is yeah, I have a morning routine. I'll drink my big cup of water. I have a devotional that I read. I got a Costco called Jesus with them. They got right here. This book. I don't know. Can you see that? I don't know. There it is. There, there it is. Yeah. The Jesus listens. Yeah. Uh, I'm by Sarah Young. So I'll read that. It's like a daily devotional. Um, mm -hmm. And then I'll write down on a post-it what I'm grateful for, I think. And so <clears throat> I'll always, so having that mindset of just once I, when I wake up, that's just a blessing. And so we try to, we implement that in our daily, in our daily lives. I know that there, it's a grind every single day. And I think that the devil, he wants to kick you down. He wants to find any sort of like weak point, weak moment. Mm -hmm. And try to play on that and try to roll with it. And so having that for me, myself, daily routine of just being grateful, just trying to get my mind and knowing that today is just, today's a blessing. It's a gift. And that's how we implement it with our children saying, how oh, to thank people, be polite, thank people, thank, think about what you're grateful for. Don't take things for granted, things like that. So that we do that daily with my kids. And as far as like my marriage, we have a marriage, we take a marriage, like a married small group from our church, we've, we're our second session now, but we did the five love languages initially. Yep. That was a great, that's a great book by Gary Chapman. Mm -hmm. And so that really, I, that was an eye opening moment, a yep. reflection for, for a creep for me, because I'm, I didn't know what she wants and knowing <laughs> what your spouse wants or what her love language is really strengthens your marriage. And so that, and now we're in like this other series called love and war. I'm not sure you write that, but we're in that. We're, we're in, we do things like that just so that our marriage stays strong. There are a lot of bumps and bumps in the road. I can't tell you that it's always been like that smooth sailing, but knowing that I've been blessed with a woman that is willing to fight for, or she doesn't like the word fight, but like work on the challenges of, um, of our marriage, knowing that, and I was thinking like that to me puts me at ease, knowing that somebody is working on our marriage and wants to definitely be with me. So that's very comforting. Yeah. I have a book. It's off. It's still like the five love languages, but it's, I think it's like, it has a Christian spin on it. And so I think it is just, you can probably read it, but it's for women. So I could probably screenshot that and put it in the Facebook group. If you, if she ever. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, yeah. For sure. Yeah. So it's more base female, but I think it, it can be for anybody. But yeah. What, what's yeah. It called? I don't know. It's something about the five love I have to, it literally on my little end table in my living room um, that I read sometimes in the morning. So I have to screenshot it for you guys. It says the five love languages, but it catered towards doing that with the, the Christian faith, yeah. I believe. Gotcha. That's right. Yeah. No, it's excellent. And one thing I wanted to point out, and you brought it up both in your discussion of getting into the real estate industry, but also in your discussion of faith is you talk about in so many words, you talked about community, right? And 
<clears throat> leveraging that community, seeking out the communities of, and the types of people that you want to be around to be like them. And I just want to highlight that because of how, how important it is for whether it's in your faith journey or your business journey or, or family or whatever it may be, seeking out that community and surrounding yourself with those types of people, probably going to be the most influential manner to make a change, right? Look, left to our own device, we're a mess, right? <laughs> if we just are counting on ourselves, we're probably going to let ourselves down. So it's super, super important, super, super critical to surround ourselves with a community of the types of people that are doing the things or that are the types of people that, that we want to be, right? Yeah. We didn't yeah, get to talk about fitness though. And I know we're like running. I, I want to talk about that too. Cause you said you do, you said you want you, you could talk about fitness too. So do you work out or do you like go on locks or what's your. Russell baby sharks. I mean, yeah, like, that's, <laughs> what do you do for fitness? Yeah. What do you do to burn calories? <laughs> yeah. I'll usually before, before I work, I go to work at usually it's at seven. So I'll go to the gym. If I can wake up early, I'll probably go at five, but usually at five 30, I'll get an hour in. If I'm mm -hmm. usually I'll have a day off in between. So that's probably easier. So then I can go in for a good hour and a half. I usually do weight. I started working out like when I was like 17, I was a scrawny Asian kid, five foot, like five foot, nothing. And I was Thank like 110 so. pounds, nothing. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't work. It doesn't translate. <laughs> oh, you're out. That doesn't translate. Like, well. your pain. And I was at a voice. Yeah. When the, 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 Trust me, no, you didn't. It's basically, <laughs> I'm going to all boy, I'm going to all boy school, high school. And I was one of the scrawnier kids. And so I started to work out. I'm like, I started working out. And I said, you know what? Girls like muscles. So I'm going to start working out. And you know, throughout the years, I've had a lot of multiple workout partners and they just dropped off because that's ah, too hard or life got in the way. You're but consistent. I've done, I've been consistent with that for the last 25 years. And nice. so now it's gotten to the point where instead of before it was, just, I just wanted to gain mass so whatnot. And now it's just before me, maybe I'm 44 years old now. It's, let's think about longevity. And it's not, been, uh, think about not injuring you know. ourselves. Exactly. Turning right. the wrong more way time. in the bed when I get up, because that's going to cause an injury. Oh yeah. hundred percent. It's more like warm up and, and cool down. <laughs> it's like more of the workout now versus the actual working out. But yeah, I'll work out like four or five times a week. Mm -hmm. Um, and then now yeah, as far as like cardio, I try to find something new. I do week, I got a mountain bike like a couple years ago. So we have a trail in the back of our, our house. So every now and then I'll go back there and do you know, like a 45 minute, um, um, bike ride. My wife is the more the, she's like you, she's the more the, she's all, all about it. She started CrossFit like a couple of years ago mm -hmm. and I thought it was just like, okay, let's just start. You're going to, you're going to put up some weight. That's cool. No, she's about handstand walking now. She's about doing the power clean. She's bragging to me about it and talking about the love language. To me personally, CrossFit is, I, I'm never, I don't think I'll, I don't think I'll ever do that. I don't think I'll be like a guy walking on my hands, looking like George of the Jungle. Um, yeah. But for her, she, I, she'll tell me what she's done and then I'll be excited about it. Come in, come in like, oh, that's awesome. Be her biggest cheerleader. So she's about it. And right now she's actually running the day. Every Tuesday, Thursday, she'll run out like a mom's group boot camp. She's oh, doing yeah. it in our backyard right now. Oh, so nice. she's a lot of the, a lot of the, the, her friends that come, four or five of them, they'll come in between pickup times for the kid and they'll come back here and she has, she does, uh, she'll make up some high intensity training workout, uh, um, for 45 minutes or whatnot. And so now for myself, I'll, I'll finally, I, I can get, I have that fit wad app or something. Like sometimes I'll pick my workouts from there do a high intensity yeah. training cardio session. So that's how I, that's how I do work. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm the same way. Like I'll tell my husband, I'm like, Oh, I get that deadlift at 200 days. Nice babe. I'm like, where's the streamers? Like <laughs> need a little more than that. Yeah. So like, oh, yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> well, no, that's, that's great. It's good to have a, a fellow gym rat. Is yeah. so. And a fellow short person. It's cool thing though. It I, I was. I, I got. A, I had a growth spurt, so now I'm six. Uh, no, you're okay. six, but <laughs> oh, you don't count anymore. I, I don't want to no, hear it. Yeah, I was like, I was literally like, but I was five three, five four, probably as a sophomore in high school, and mm -hmm. then, but I was skinny. I was like, I'm in my twenty five pound, one hundred thirty pound, and then I bulked up, and then that, so I bulked up super fast. I didn't take any like all natty, 
like that. <laughs> so them guys talk about, it. but then I got like the stretch marks on my shoulders. So I got, I went crazy. That I went to sense. the gym like almost every day, ate a lot. Yeah. But wow. I just heard that saying literally yesterday as my husband said, all natty. And I was like, are you talking about natural light beer? I thought he was talking about the natty. He was like, no, you let the people natty, say natty. that. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I thought he was. He, he, he was like, no, that's what they say in the gym if they're like, naturally don't do anything I'll, uh, oh okay so two days in a row that's uh, i heard that on instagram or tiktok i was like what natty natty, yeah. or, nat- natty or, or roy i don't know that's a, you know, a you, oh, oh gosh i have a new hashtag you can use kale what's that hashtag natty daddy <laughs> all of y'all can use it i think all the men in the fit- fitness group should use it there we go listen i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna tag kale Every post I, I get, I'm gonna hashtag. say for Kale, hashtag Natty Daddy in the group. You're gonna see it. I'm big. Yeah. Whatever I have something I'm intentional about, I'll do it. Yep. That's I cool. will I will respond and, and support you in that comment. There we go. <laughs> Wonderful. That's a heck of a growth spurt. I wish I could yeah, say me too. the same level of growth spurt in <laughs> in my high school years, but my growth spurt was four ten to five foot and then it just stopped. <laughs> oh man. I'm going to, I'm going to share that with my, maybe I shouldn't cause I don't want to get his hopes up, but my oldest son is, <laughs> he's on the shorter side and he's very self-conscious about that. I was going to share that story, but now I don't want to. How old is he? He is 12. So, I, you know, he's going to hit a growth. Oh, yeah. He's going to hit that growth. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, I hit it like a mile, like 17. Uh, I'm still I, waiting for mine. Like 16, 17. <laughs> I know I'll get there. Oh, have faith. There you have go. Faith. But, but yeah, no, I, some other thing I was, I don't know. I don't know how tall I was or whatever at that age, but same thing, naturally slim, slim build more or less. And so that's one of the reasons that I started working out as well. And I think I was like 14 when I first started and uh, yeah, you just quickly see, start to see the results. You like it and, and you stick uh-huh. with it. You know, y'all should do it before and after picture so I can see what y'all used to look like. That'd be neat. Oh no, you don't want to see it. My, uh, my, 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 my parents cut my hair. They're in high school. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you, I don't like here. You know what? I had a bowl cut until I was in the sixth or seventh grade. And then I didn't like brushing my hair as a kid, as a tomboy. And so I had a bowl cut and then my mom permed it. So I had a perm and my sister <laughs> called me Richard Simmons for three years. Oh, come on. <laughs> you, share those. you gotta share those. Those are no, you tell you them. no. If you share that and uh, and Natty Daddy here shares theirs, I will share mine. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, I'm good. I'm not, that's good. I'm not, you know, I don't need know. that out on social media at all. So. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, we'll, we'll try to dig something up here, <laughs> so, but, but no, that that's excellent. So obviously you're, you got a lot going on here. You're still building out your career as a nurse anesthetist. You're starting and building your, your real estate portfolio digging in and diving in and growing in your faith journey, still on with your fitness. <clears throat> do you feel, I don't know, how do I want to ask it? Do you feel that you're able to do those things harmoniously or relatively in balance at this stage in your life? Or do you feel that it's one area is off kilter at this time? To be honest with you, I, it's a little overwhelming. Right. So just having the new, just adding something new on there, having just taking a lot of, it's the daily, like a work in progress. I wouldn't say, I don't know which one, like the, the real estate thing, like I said, I was dropping off and just being more intentional about the marketing piece and trying to push it. And it's not a thing or forget it else. You know, there are times where, you know, the last couple of months I was with family having, you know, the kids are out of school, so I'm vacationing with them and then works there. So then I, that, that cup kind of went, you know, a little low. And so now that the kids are in school, maybe that cup will fill up a little bit. So, uh, I'm trying to learn how to do a little more time audits here and there to try and block off some, some time for each and every, everyone. But for the most part, the real estate investment is just tangible thing that can come and go. I think what's more important is my faith and family. So whenever, every now and then my wife will be like, we gotta have a date night. Or we have it. I'm feeling like we're roommates right now. This will transparency. So that kind of, she said that here and there, but that's just her signal of saying you're, you're the, the cup here is running low. So you gotta, yeah. let, let's pick it up a notch and spending too much time here. 
I get in my head a little too much, I like hit head too much thinking that, okay, if I can cut four, 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 four hours, four hours, four hours there, <laughs> that'd be great. But it's not like that. <laughs> it's got to, it, it doesn't, it's not equal 33% equal amounts in those three. I would say that there is an imbalance it, and I'm trying to be better at trying to recognize the imbalance before it gets the, I don't know, a little justice, the little, little lady with the weight say goes way far down here and falls off. Right. But I wouldn't say it's like a perfect harmony right now to balance things because it's a daily, daily work, being a dad, being a husband, that's first and foremost, being the son of God, another, mm -hmm. another, that up of the line, everything else, whatever. Yeah. I like that you said that because uh, I've literally had the same, I, I think me and my husband have said the same thing. We feel like roommates right now. It, I like that you say that because a lot of people come on here and they're like, I only have time to devote to these three things and these three things get 100% of my time. And then people yeah. will listen and they think, oh, I have these three things too, but like I'm struggling to make them all even. And it's not. It's one day it's going to be like this thing is the priority. And one day it's going to fall off because you're doing something else. And I like hearing your story because you are a father. You are a full-time um, employee. Yeah. You're a husband and you're an investor. Then you need to take the time to work out. Then you need to take the time to make sure being the true son of God and, and stuff like one of God's sons and all of that stuff. And you can't give 100% to everything. And so mm -hmm. I really like when people come on and they're honest and they really say the things that are actually happening because like us, like well, all of us have that imposter syndrome. We hear something, we're like, well, how come I can't be as good as this person? But really nobody's that great because unless they, I don't know, like a beautiful mind and they can do four things at once. Um, <laughs> Everybody yeah, but he had his demons himself, you know. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, oh yeah. Nobody's perfect, and so I love hearing that that story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We do gotta get into the wrap up section here. So we like to ask our guests for three actionable or practical tips based on what we discussed that you can leave our audience with. Like I said, find the tribe, find the people that you want that align with your values. I started a men's group like. Myself, that was one of my goals to start a Bible study. It was a, a goal that I, I've never done one before. I've never been a leader before. I've never coached. I've never led anybody. So I thought it was like one of these goals that I made for 2023 was to do that. And I sought out curriculum. I did the Tony Dungy Quiet Strength Curriculum Men's Study. Not sure if you're familiar with that, but that was really good. And we're in our fifth lesson now. And I chose like these, I asked certain people, certain guys that I'm close to. Um, mm -hmm. Specifically, just because I knew that, okay, if I'm going to make this thing successful and I don't want to feel like I'm defeated, I need to get guys that are going to buy it. And so that one was really like, that's been really fulfilling for me because I've got these group of guys that are, they have their dads, they're working, they've got struggles. We all share our struggles. We're all pretty, very transparent about our struggles, knowing that we're not alone in this journey and also having that base, that big base in, in, in problem solving. And that's what, one of the biggest tips I can tell people is try to find the people that are aligned with your goals and try to get aligned with them or try to make friends with them, be next to them, because they'll only make you better. And another, I don't know, as far as like working out, I was reading, I was listening to a podcast once and somebody was saying like, and it really hit me and it was like, God made you in, in the image of himself then that is your his body. That's your him. You want to take care of that body. You don't want to abuse it or whatnot because that, in, in essence, is going against him or just abusing him. So personally, that's as far as like my fitness goal and my fitness aspirations and working out. That's in my forefront is I've only got this body one. And we only have this body for one time in our lives. So we've got to take care of it, <clears throat> nurture it, and try to be a better version of myself. And so that's how I dive deep into how I take into workouts or whatnot. And then just trying to get self-improvement. I read a lot of books now, nowadays. I do a lot of like self-help books. There's a lot of real estate books out in the sea as well. And then a lot of podcasts. I don't listen to, a, I don't listen to or read a lot of the, or watch new, the news on TV. I specifically go towards like podcasts that kind of make me feel a little better from, from certain people, the Ryan Canada, your guys is, I think Leonard e. Smith has one as well. He's a good guy. So I list a lot of podcasts. So that's what I do. 
This is awesome. I think be about the best tip there. Don't watch yeah. the news. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> Bryce, oh, did you see about that hurricane? I'm like, no, nah, I guess I need to look at that. But yeah. Oh, yeah. It's Bra- and in a, a little supermarket, people were doomsday prepped. <laughs> yeah. Just cases of water. The hurricane just came for a day, literally a day. And now it's sunny, no oh, clouds, yeah. it's 80 degrees outside. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing, though. <laughs> Brenna? All right. What's your favorite pizza? Where from and why? Oh, yeah, I remember that. You were asking about that before. It's there's a place called, I believe, Giovanni. It's in Manor yeah, yeah. Mountain. Have you been there? Giovanni's, yeah, it's got the deep dish, right? I don't know if it's got the deep dish. We have to get my wife has, has a gluten allergy. Okay. So, cool. oh, I, I, I want to say Giovanni's. But anyway, it's in Mammoth Mountain. Have you been to Mammoth? I haven't, but is it a chain or is this like a local place? No, it's like a local place. Okay, there's a chain like called Giovanni. All right, local. All right. Yeah, and it's like whenever we go snowboarding, skiing, I don't know what it is about the altitude, but <laughs> something about the altitude, there's something about like bread or the crust. After I ski, it's, I'm like, I could eat a shark. Like, I could eat that yeah. much. Yeah. Maybe it's that, but this place, literally, we go there, we're like, we got to get pizza there. We have pizza places down here. We usually, it's okay. But I don't know what it is about the altitude because we'll go up to Big Bear and there's a mom and pop shop there and it's pretty good. But the one in Mammoth, I believe it's called Giovanni's Pizza because we only go there like once a year because we are up there like once a year. But every time we go there, the crust or the, the dough, for some reason, the uh, thin air or something just makes it nice and fuzzy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that sounds good. Every time we do, like when we do this podcast, it's like right afterwards is another meeting and then I have lunch. And so at this point, when we talk about pizza, I'm like, that sounds really good, though. I'll have to yeah, check that out. Good. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ramel, for coming on and sharing your story with us. And where can our listeners reach out to you or stalk you or whatever yeah. they need? Well, I'm on Facebook. Just find me, Ramel Javier. On Instagram, it was like my, I started Instagram when my son was born. J. Cole Papa. <laughs> J. Cole underscore Papa. J. Cole is my son's name. Jordan Cole. Yeah. And it's Papa, or just obviously touch my name there. And we have an Instagram page for the our cabin in Maggie Valley. Okay. Um, my wife named it called Beyond Underscore the Underscore Trees B and B. So it's amateur hour here because I'm the one that, that putting it up. I I try posts on there. They have like reviews for my past cats or pictures, and I even like tag. I follow a lot of Instagram um, people that are hiking in North Carolina or whatnot, and I put them on my story just so that they can see the beauty or the smoke yeah. from the North Carolina side. Nice. Awesome. Very good, very good. Excellent. Thank you again. And hey, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Tune in next week. Thank you, guys.